intrigued and for a little while is look at a couple of arguments for the existence of God. You know that the Bible nowhere says, oh, well, let me give you this argument and this will prove the existence of God. It just begins with the reality of God in the beginning God. I think uh, these two arguments for the existence of God are relatively easy to follow, and uh, I think they are relatively strong in their what they're designed to do and prove the existence of God. First one I'll introduce to you in the form of a question. <clears throat> uh, what is the most frequently raised objection against theism of any sort? And if you answered, it's the problem of evil, then that would be the right answer. If you read the literature, you'll find that tends to be the one that comes out the most. There's a reason for this. Um, there's one thing that every person who is rational on this earth knows, and that has to do with no matter who you are or where you live. And that is that the world's broken. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. That's the complaint. And they simply uh, don't mean that things happen they don't like. That'd be just simply relativism. They mean they're really evil, wicked things. That take place. In other words, evil is objective. Now, since this awareness of things are broken, if you please, is a universal one, it's, in other words, an undeniable and obvious feature of reality. We can actually, when looking at the problem of evil, so called, use it as an ally to make our case for the existence of God. Uh, contrary to what is popular belief, the problem of evil is not then an argument against the existence of God. It's actually one of the best arguments for God's existence. The problem with the problem of evil is that if God does not, I say does not exist, there cannot be any real evil to object to. Now, here's the reason why. The complaint about evil requires transcendent universal laws that govern the world objective morality. In order for real evil to exist is a violation of those laws. Transcendent moral laws require a transcendent moral law maker, and that's God. Saying the world is um, supposed to be a certain way, as one fellow said, requires a sposer, so to speak. That is someone who intended the world to be much better than it is. Now, if there is no God, then there's no transcendent moral lawmaker. If there's no transcendent moral lawmaker, then there's no universal moral laws. All of us are obligated to obey. And if there are no moral laws, then there are no broken laws. And if there are no broken laws, then there's no problem of evil. Simply put, if there's no God, there can be no evil. And of course, no good for that matter. But that's the way it would work concerning the so-called one of the chief arguments that atheists like to use to try to say there's no God, that is the argument of evil, it really backfires in their face. Now, if you want to look at the way it's formally set out, 
in a syllogism, a formal syllogism for the moral argument for the God's existence. It goes like this. Major premise, if there's no God, then there's no objective morality. In other words, no, no lawmaker, then no laws. That would be the major premise. Now, the minor premise is, but there is objective morality. And that's evidenced by the problem of evil. And the conclusion is simply, therefore, there is a God. Now, the form, if you want to get into the logic of it, for anybody that's had any logic, the form of the syllogism is valid. It's a modus tollens form. And the premises are true. So the argument is sound. And when the premises are true and the argument is uh, the uh, syllogism valid, then everything is correct. Now, leaving that one on the problem of evil and how it really works against the atheists, the second argument for God's existence has been around a long time, too, and it's called, if you read about it and listen to different philosophers, they'll refer to it as the column cosmological argument. And I think it's quite easy to understand. Oh, and by the way, a cosmological argument is any argument for God's existence that's based on the mere existence of the cosmos, and that is the universe. And here's the basic idea in the column cosmological argument. Our first statement or major premise is for anything that came into existence there must have been something that caused it to come into existence. We might even take here and talk about an adequate cause. Uh, clearly, effects have causes. Uh, pretty basic. I think that's entirely consistent with our common sense experience of the world. The minor premise, and we got our second statement is the material universe, that's the cosmos, came into existence sometime in the past. Now, sometime many years ago, scientists came up with the idea that there was the Big Bang, and they called it the Big Bang. Now, what a lot of those atheists didn't realize when they did that was they were admitting that there was a point where time and material things began. They don't like to do that, but their scientific facts has forced them to say that the universe had a beginning, and they described it as a big bang. So the conclusion is the material universe must have had a cause, and we can say here it must have been an adequate cause to bring about this universe. Now, I guess to put as simply as we know how, I used to say years ago that who boomed the bang when it came to the Big Bang Theory. I read another one a while back that said, if you've got a Big Bang, then a Big Bang needs a Big Banger. So they haven't freed themselves of the necessity of a being capable of creating universe and that it did have a beginning and their scientific evidence proves it had a beginning. So they call it the Big Bang. Now that bang did not bang itself. And by the way, the, this uh, line of thinking puts the cause of the cosmos outside the material universe. And uh, we always talk about God beginning things by uh, creating everything out of nothing, just by the power of his word. Ex nihilo, creation. Two kinds of creation, by the way, I mentioned that going by. There is the creating of, of everything out of nothing but the power of God's word. But then he also took things he created and made other things out of it. Uh, he didn't speak man out of nothing into existence. He took dust already into existence and made man. Same true with woman. He didn't create her out of nothing. He took a rib and made her. So there's, there's two kinds of creation in the beginning that you read about in Genesis. That ought to be kept in mind. But the Big Bang needs a Big Banger. It didn't bang itself. 
So he who made the material universe had to start the thing. He had a beginning. Atheists just do not like that. So the cause would have to be immaterial, intelligent, powerful, and personal, since only persons can start a causal chain of events. This argument does not prove the God of the Bible. It never was meant to. It proves simply what Romans 1 says, that by nature we can determine God is. To know God as God wants man to know him, then he has to reveal his knowledge to us. Thus, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He gave us a revelation of himself, and you can go a lot more into that. But this all gets pretty close, and I would say, though we won't do it tonight, that the next thing I would do to prove the existence of the God who reveals himself in the Bible, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I would simply go to the resurrection of Christ. Someone has to show that the evidence of the resurrection of Christ in the four accounts of the gospel is just not so. It's just not there. And I don't think that could be done when it's properly handled. So if you prove the resurrection of Christ, then you prove that the God that we've been talking about in both of these arguments is the God of the Bible and the one that Moses talked about when he said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So I thought I would uh, deal with those two as uh, two, two proofs that are, I think, quite easy to understand. We don't do a lot of this kind of thinking like we ought to, but uh, at least among the average one of us, but it needs to be done because we don't just accept that God is, the Bible is the word of God without proof, and we're told not to do so. It's a command of God that we don't accept anything about him or what he said, except that we can prove it. Prove all things. Well, God's one of those all things. The deity of Christ is one of those all things. The inspiration of the scriptures one of those all things. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. First Thessalonians 5, 21. And uh, one of the things I did that I'll mention now is showing that in this uh, using valid, uh, using logic, which is just simply the science of correct reasoning, then you can know that God exists. And you can know that he's the God who reveals himself in the Bible. And you can know what you believe and why you believe it. And you can understand, just like you can from the Bible, what to do to be saved, the steps of the plan of salvation, the work, the organization, the life to be lived in the church, all of that. It's all figured out by the same mind God gave us, a mind to think with, to reason with, and to take in the adequate evidence and reason adequately and come to the proper conclusion. Thank you very much. I hope it was helpful.